Welcome Anchor Church to our online service. We are so glad to have you here. We would love it if you would check out our YouTube page, our YouTube channel, Anchor Church ABQ. Go there and like and subscribe to our channel. Make sure to hit that bell notification so every time we post a video, you get a notification. Also, if you're watching with us, please let us know. Write down in the comments below, just let us know that you're here. Even if it's May 2022, let us know you're here so we can be praying for you. We'll be right back with the sermon for today. Hey, Anchor family, welcome in. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Uh, good morning to you, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this with us. Uh, so glad you're here joining us today as we're walking through this series uh, called Finding Meaning in the Seasons of Life. And we're looking today at just the great hope that we can have as the believer in Christ because uh, in the tough times and seasons because God is in control of all things. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time looking today at how God has ordered different things in life, how he makes everything beautiful in its time, and certainly the hope and the faith that we get to come from that, and just what a blessing it truly is to the, the people of God to be able to uh, walk in that in this world that's often full of struggle and trial. So if you have your Bibles handy, get them open with me. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 today, we're looking at verses 9 through 15, and we're walking through, uh, finding how God's moving from this futility we've talked about so much across the first two chapters of this book, really moving it into something that is beautiful now. We're going from futility into beauty as we look at these scriptures. So let's get them open here again. Chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, verses 9 through 15, and it says this, What gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the business that God has given the children of man to be busy with. He's made everything beautiful in its time. Maybe that's something you want to highlight in your Bible because that's a big point we're looking at today. <clears throat> beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into a man's heart that so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than that they be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink to the pleasure <coughs> and all his toil. This is God's gift to man. What, what a great gift in this world here. And going on, verse 14, I perceived whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. God has done it so that people would fear him. That which has already been and which is to be already has been. And God seeks that which has been driven away. Let's pray together as we jump into this time. Father, we're, we're grateful today for your word that reassures us that there is great meaning and purpose behind the things in life as, we, as long as we keep you as the focus. So Father, as we walk through this time, I pray that we would find uh, hope and encouragement and peace through this message that looks at futility of life. And Lord, may we just be reminded all the more of who you are. You are the sovereign Lord, the King of kings, the King of glory, who by your grace has decided to save us. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. May we walk in hope through the tough times of life as we look at these scriptures today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you remember last week, we were looking at verses 1 through 8, which is just kind of this great poem that uh, Solomon put out for us. He uses this, this great literature to go back and forth and explain about the different times and the seasons in life. You know, there's a, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. There's a time to love. There's a time to hate. There's a time for war. There's a time for peace. There's a time for everything, the Bible tells us there. And so he's coming out of this poem, he's ended this, this, uh, this beautiful kind of poem there and walks back into just the, the narrative of, of discussing how things are going. And he asks the same question he asked us at the very beginning of the book. In uh, chapter 1, verse 3, he said, What does man get out of all this toil? It's a rhetorical question saying we're not getting anything out of it. To, to have the things of the world, to chase them, to have them be our source of contentment or even our, our desire to find contentment in is always going to leave us lacking. So the rhetorical question is, what does man get out of the toil of life? We get nothing. We get nothing. It's, it's a bad deal for us to go to try to find peace in those things at the expense of chasing the eternal things. And in verse 10, he uh, reminds us that it's a hard work that God has given us. He says, I've seen the work that God has given man to do under the sun. It, it's an echo of verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, where he says, I've seen the work that God has given man to do. 
He's given everything, of course, and it's right time. And, and we should work diligently for with our things we invest in the world here that as long as they're pointed in the right direction are not futile when they're not pursued in that way. Uh, but we know that it's an unhappy business that God has given us. Some translations actually make that say uh, it's, it's a lousy job that God has given us. Not that God has done something lousy. Just what we have to do, what we're walking through is lousy. It's hard. It's difficult sometimes. Day-to-day life is a struggle, isn't it? There's a lot of truth to that. Even if we're, by God's grace, we're able to help keep a good attitude in that or continue to walk through with strength and push through the hard times, there's still a lot of difficulty in it sometimes. We as the Christian have the grace of God and his Holy Spirit to walk with us, but still, it doesn't change how we feel in the moment about it, right? Uh, It's hard to walk through tough times. It's a struggle. The work that God has given us certainly is difficult at times. We start to get better clarity on this, though, as we look at verse 11. He starts to break out for us a bit more to see and understand what's really going on behind the scenes and seeing how really God is in, in fact, is over all things. He's sovereign over all things. He's in control of all the times and all the seasons that walk through life. And so as we walk through this, as we talk about times, as we talk about seasons and events and activities that are on here, as we talk about the work that man does, verse 11 really starts to show us what's going on behind the scenes in all this. It's here we see much of what we discussed about last week where we talked about the sovereignty of God, uh, how he's in control of all things. We talked about how Psalm uh, 90 verse 2 tells us that God is from everlasting to everlasting. He is God. Present tense, no matter when he is, no matter where he is, he is God to its fullness. We talked about how he's sovereign over creation in that he said, let there be, and then there was. And how he's sovereign over how he makes creation in that, uh, you know, he says, who makes the seeing or the blind? It's the Lord. He's the one who does that. He's the one who's over all creation in that. We know that he's over salvation. Jesus told us plainly, no one can even come to Jesus unless the Father allows them or calls them to him. We know he orders the steps of people. We looked at how uh, God had worked in Joseph's brothers, selling him into slavery. We saw how God worked in hardening Pharaoh's heart. We saw how he called Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan king, my servant, used him to judge his people and then judged him for judging his people. God is sovereign over all things, church. You know, we looked at how we can properly understand how man's role is still to be faithful to God, even though God is over all things and directing him. And we saw how in Proverbs 16, 9, that that man plans his way. We make our own steps. We choose how we're going to go. But God works all that out. He directs it. And he does that because he does whatever he pleases. That's what Psalm 115 says. Our God is in heaven. And he does whatever he pleases. So God's sovereignty is central to all these things here. As a matter of fact, church, uh, if we don't start to really understand who God is, who we are, and the true sovereignty and power and the reach that God has, we're going to be missing a big piece of the puzzle. We're going to have a lot of questions that will always go unanswered or we'll find answers to those questions that are not the right ones. They're going to leave us wanting more because we're always going to have to go, well, how come this, that, when if we say God has done it, that's the answer. We can rest in who God is and what he's done because he is sovereign. Now we're going to see again more of that come to light today as we look at these verses. So in verse 11, we already read it. Uh, Let's let's, let's read through here together. Let's let's, let's not miss it again. So verse 11, uh, he says, He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So in these three verses here, or this verse, we see three different things come to light. We see, one, that God has made everything beautiful in his time. God has taken the initiative. God has put it into work in his plan, his purpose, as he sees fit. The second thing, he's put eternity in the heart of man. He's put a desire for eternal things into the person, into each individual that's out there. And the third thing, uh, people cannot know, cannot understand or comprehend the eternal things of God. And that's the way he has said it. So let's pick these three apart. Let's let's get a bigger depth of understanding as we talk about this sovereignty. The first part again, he has made everything beautiful in its time. This, This works under God's sovereignty. He has ordained the times. He has ordained the seasons. He's ordained the activities and the events, all as they should be. The way that they're going to work the best. He's ordained everything to its proper time and its proper place. He's made us. He's made humans in the same way. He's fashioned us. He's put us at this place at this time. Acts 17, 26 tells us that he ordained our seasons, our times, our boundaries. That basically says that God put us when he wanted us, where he wanted us. You, right now, where you're sitting in your home right now, hearing this message, God's Holy Spirit is working on you, and he's designed it that this time would be the best thing for that. 
He's ordained these times and seasons. He's put us where we are for his time, for his purpose, for his kingdom. And it says in all these times, all these events, all these seasons, as he works in us, that they work out for their appointed time. They are wonderful. They are beautiful in all their ways because God has made them that way in that time. It's very hard to process some of those times, though, isn't it? Just this past week, uh, I, I lost a friend who uh, I've known for years to COVID. And I've walked through that, that loss of her with her husband, who's a, who's a good friend of mine. And I have cried a lot this week, church. I've cried a lot for, for, the, for, the, for the loss, for the pain that's there. She was a believer. By God's grace, we absolutely rejoice that we get to see her again someday. And to the praise of our Father, who she rejoices with right now, what a great thing. But the here and the now, that is heartbreaking. And it hurts to lose a job, and it hurts to be fearful about the future. It hurts to be walking in darkness. It hurts to deal with chronic pain. It hurts to deal with discontent. So many things do not feel beautiful or do not appear beautiful in the time. So many things leave us wanting, and that is hard to process. They may not appear beautiful in the moment, but God's word and God is true. That means at the appropriate time, when they are right in their season, they will become beautiful because God works in them. God makes those things beautiful. They may not appear beautiful in the moment, but rest assured, God will make those in their time. And we see that come to light by the way this is phrased. He uses the word beautiful here, which is the, the Hebrew word yepeh. And in the Old Testament, it, it means beautiful. It means something, something good to look at, you know, something pleasing to the eye. But as many things do, as you work through time, seasons, across time, uh, that word beautiful kind of morphed a little bit to mean appropriate in its time, right in its time. And that's exactly what it means here is it's something good, it's something right, it's something pleasing, it's something appropriate for its time. It's working as it should in that right time. So to say uh, beautiful doesn't necessarily mean that God makes a promotion or a, a car wreck or something terrible. It makes it beautiful, not necessarily pretty to look at. What it means is that he makes every time, every season, every event, the good and the bad and the indifferent, everything in the middle, he makes them appropriate, beautiful, right in their time. How it's going to produce the best outcome for the moment and what it's trying to do is how he enacts that. You know, it wouldn't be wrong for us to say, look how beautiful things worked out in that situation. You know, if, if, a, if a couple is, is having trouble in their marriage and they're, and they're separated for a time, we would absolutely say, what a beautiful thing for them to come back together. But it would also be right to say it's appropriate for them to come back because that's what God's design is, that the, the husband and wife would be together. Amen? They ought to be together in that. God makes everything appropriate and rightly working in its time. He sets it in motion at its proper time. The wheels are turning. The things in society, the things in life are working in their proper time. And they all follow according to God's sovereign knowledge, his sovereign work, his plan, his purpose, as they should in their perfect time, in their appropriate time, in their right time. Now, I don't want to belabor this point, but I wanted to ask a question, something that came up to me as I'm reading through this. I'm starting to ask the question, what is appropriate? What is appropriate itself referencing? What is the word? What is the focus here? What makes this time, what makes that event, what makes that season appropriate? What makes it of value? Let me give you an example of what I'm trying to, to try to say here of appropriateness. Uh, friends, I wouldn't wear a tuxedo t-shirt to my wedding, right? My wife would probably, my soon-to-be wife may not even be my wife if I wear a tuxedo t-shirt. That's going to be upsetting to her, right? That is not the appropriate time to wear that. I wouldn't wear a tuxedo t-shirt to my wedding, but I might wear it to yours. Just as a joke, you know, if we're close enough, I might wear a tuxedo t-shirt to yours because it's funny. And what dictates whether or not it's appropriate for me to wear is the time and the event, right? There are times where that might be okay for me, but there's a time where it's not appropriate for me. And it was the event itself that's doing that in that scenario. So God working in this here, in the scheme of everything that happens in time, in eternity, in every event that works in your life, in your neighbor's life, in the scheme of all of creation, what are we talking about? What, what's referencing appropriate there? What does everything in creation look to, point to? What are we looking to see happen correctly at the right time? There's a lot of options if we think about it. Um, one of them, we can absolutely see God working in our lives to grow us and make us more like Christ, right? We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purposes. So training us up in that way. Romans 8, 29 says we're supposed to be conformed to the image of Christ. So that builds us up more and more in him in those times and seasons. That's a, that's a good 
possibility, right? Another one might be uh, to keep the world systems, to keep the climate, to keep the tides working in their order. Those things work at their right time, so they bring about the appropriate thing. Again, uh, working good for our spiritual growth, working, working things out good in our lives. Some, some of those are blessings, how God works for those. Ultimately, the goal of all things for appropriate, when they happen, what happens, when they happen, how they happen, every single one of those things works to glorify God. Every single thing in creation, every single event, every activity works to glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at these verses here. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. What is creation? What is the sky? What's the heaven? What are the stars doing? What are the, what are the supernovas doing? What are the asteroids? What are, what are black holes doing? They're glorifying God. They're showing that they're, this immensity that we see in space are nothing but minuscule dots to the king of kings. He is sovereign over that. What are humans doing here on the earth? Isaiah 43, 7 says that God created us, created humans, to give him glory. The reason you're here right now and not dead in heaven or being tormented for, for rejecting Christ, the reason you're here is to bring glory to God. And FYI, even outside of that, whether you go to heaven or hell, you will still bring glory. You'll bring glory to God in heaven by praising, worshiping him forever, thanking him for saving him, or being judged rightly for, con for being, uh, being convicted of sin, for rebelling against God. Luke 19.40 tells us, if the people would stop, if people wouldn't cry out that God is the Lord, that Jesus is the Messiah, the very stones would cry out. Everything in creation, including times, events, work to promote and point to God, to give him glory. That's what's appropriate here, church. That means that every single thing points to him. Every created being, every element, every thought, every action, every weather pattern proclaims the glory of God. Every bird song, every child's laugh, every bit of photosynthesis happening as plants convert oxygen from carbon dioxide, as our lungs push out that carbon dioxide to feed those plants, that glorifies God. Every salvation, every repentant sinner, every work of ministry, every punishment of the wicked works to glorify God. Every circumstance, every time, every season, every matter, every event, every activity under heaven works to glorify God. Everything in creation points to him. Everything is meant to work, to give glory to God. Every one of these honors and glorifies God. So what are we talking about when we say it's appropriate in its time? We say that God made this perfect, appropriate, beautiful, working exactly as it should in this moment, in this time, in this season, in this activity of your life. It is working appropriately to bring glory to God. His sovereign plan, his sovereign purpose has worked at every single moment, every second, every event, every activity, working so that in that moment, they will bring about the perfect, appropriate, right timing to glorify God to the best way in the nth degree. What is appropriate is glorifying God. What is appropriate in this time is glorifying God. God, why did that event happen in your life? To glorify God. It could be to grow you, to do other things, but it is to glorify God. Everything in creation points to the great mercy, the glory of our great King. You know, church, if we have a, a God-focused life as opposed to a, a vain-focused life where we're looking, again, at the eternal things and not just at the temporal things that are in life, where we don't try to chase contentment through possessions or through other things, when we have that God-focused life, that's how we're able to easily see and agree with Him that even in the loss of a loved one, even walking through a global pandemic, living in a society right now that is constantly at odds with each other over political views, as well as the good things of a child's laugh, of a bird song, of seeing a beautiful sunset, every single one of those helps us to say, God made it beautiful in its time because it is working for his glory. Church, right here, right now, you are on this earth to bring glory to God. Those ways, those manners, those times, those seasons, they will look different. But you are here ultimately to glorify God. And when we remember that, when we keep our eyes focused on that eternal purpose, that's where we can say, even in the worst to even the best, everything has worked appropriate and it is beautiful. Because it works for the eternal plan of God. He has made everything beautiful. You know, it's interesting that as we talk about times and seasons, as we move on to the next part of the verse here, he, he kind of steps outside of time. He steps outside of time and starts to look at some of eternity. 
He's not focusing just on the, the temporal times here, the, the, the days, the weeks, the months here. We're looking at the eternal focus of these things here. As he says, God has put eternity into man's heart. God has put eternity in man's heart. We, we have a desire for something bigger than ourselves, right? Even if even non-believers hope that there is some kind of heaven, usually does not involve God, but there's a, a better place is what we usually hear, right? When so-and-so has died, they've gone to a better place. That's the idea. We, we want something bigger than here. We desire to know the bigger things of life. We, even as just as a species, we want to look to the heavens. We want to say, is there life out there, right? Is there, is there more things above us? We desire to know the bigger things. We specifically as Christians, and uh, those outside of the church don't know yet, but God has ingrained into people a desire to know and to connect with eternal things. We were created to do eternal works. You know, the human soul is eternal. One of the few things that is eternal. God is eternal. His word is eternal. And the human soul is eternal. We have eternity in our hearts. We have a desire to know the eternal things. We were created to work for eternal spiritual purposes. God put eternity into our heart. And that's why nothing in this created world can ever satisfy us. Because our base needs, the ones for the human spirit, are eternal needs. They're eternal things that are always looking to the things of God. That someone answers the question of why we chase futility. You know, God has put eternal things in us, but we live in a physical, temporal world. And because of sin, as well as our own, just our, our, our wicked desires that we have in ourselves, we go after, we've got these eternal desires, but we can't see those eternal desires, so we chase what we can see. And by doing that, we run into futility. We're trying to meet these eternal needs with these temporal things that just can't do it. You know, I've mentioned this example before. If you're starving, if you've been running around, you, you want a plate of vegetables and steak, but to walk up to that would be to go and just eat a bag of Skittles instead. That's like trying to fill up these eternal needs with temporal things. They're not going to do it. It's going to leave you wanting all the more. It's problematic when we try to fill an eternal need with a temporal substance. You know, we add to that. We've got eternity in heart, but we add to this that it says in the last half of verse 11, people cannot even know the eternal things of God. We can't understand all that he's doing. From the beginning of things to the end of all things, God's doing what he's doing, and we don't get it. Did you know that? If you thought you got it, uh, maybe you have a word from the Lord. Let's verify it against Scripture, but odds are you don't know because it says we can't get that. We can't understand those things. The Bible reminds us over and over, uh, Romans eleven thirty four. who has known the mind of God? Who's going to be God's counselor? Who's going to instruct the Lord there? Isaiah 55, 9 says, as, high, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Do you think you could ever go out to your backyard and figure out a way to explain quantum physics to an ant? Do you think you could go out and tell an ant that your name is Carl? Do you think you'd say, hey, ant, there's, there's food over there? No. And it's not just the language barrier. It's the intellect. It's the understanding is so much higher we are infinitesimally small compared to the Lord. We cannot comprehend those things. How much higher are the heavens than the earth? If you were to ask NASA how big is, is space, they would say, we don't know. Because every time we look, it's bigger. It just keeps getting bigger. God is larger than that. He says that the heavens and the earth, all those things, they're just a span. That's a span. If you've ever read through Isaiah, he said, they're but a span to the Lord. And that is a span right there. That's about how big the Lord says all things are. That's how much larger he is. Of course, we're not going to get those eternal things, especially as sinful, fallen creatures. By God's grace, we've been redeemed and brought into his family. We have eternal security, of course. But that doesn't mean we get the all the behind-the-scenes look at everything that God is doing. If God is in control of all things and we aren't, if we've been created for eternal things, not temporal, vain ones, if we're limited in our ability to even understand the things of God, where does that leave us in these times? I mean, if, if he's uh, made everything beautiful in his time, he's working it, that's, that's not always beautiful to us in the moment. If, if he's put eternity into our heart, we have that desire to know those eternal things, but we can't know all those eternal things. What should we do? Should, should we just tough it out? Should we suck it up? Should, should we mope around? Should we be sad all the time? Should we, should we cry and wail about not being in control or not God not giving us these other insights like selfish little children? What should we do? He says in verses 12 through 13, the very best thing you could do, the absolute best thing you could do is enjoy this life that God has given you. Let's look at those verses together. Verses 12 through 13. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. All this work that we don't like. 
All this work that we don't get any value from, we should do that. And why? Because it's God's gift to man. It is God's gift to man. He says the absolute best thing you can do is don't, don't run off and mope. Don't run off and cry. Don't just tough it out either. Don't just suck it up. Don't hang in there. But rejoice. Say that with me. Rejoice. Let's do with what, what 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says. It says rejoice always. Rejoice always. You know, we see him taking this and going from futility to enjoyment. We can take joy in these things. We ought not be depressed or discouraged by these things, church. We ought to take great joy and say, Lord, thank you for providing me with this life, with these, these things, with the knowledge. If, we are, if you're a Christian and you're watching this, let's praise God that we are Christians, that we have this ability to do these things. This is a, the simple command he's given us. You know, Christians ought to be the happiest people on the earth. I've met a lot of miserable Christians. I, too, I, I recognize in myself even some guilt in that. At that, uh, I've got to be mindful of how I look because sometimes I'm just walking through life and I've got you know, that rest and just I'm a jerk face, right? Just I don't care. I, I, and maybe the beard is intimate. I ought to be walking around with joy in my eyes and in my, in my life, in my face because of what Christ has done for us. We ought to be the happiest people in the world because we can take joy in the work that we've got here. The things of the world are temporal and they're worthless out there. But when we put an internal focus on them, they're fantastic. We get to know and to serve and to love Christ here. What a blessing. People outside the church, people outside the family of God do not have that. They are missing a critical element. It makes sense for them to mope and to be depressed and to be sad. There's nothing to hope for in this world. But we as the Christian, because of Christ, we have hope, we have peace, we have unity with the Holy Spirit. We have future to hope forward, to look forward to. Church, we are blessed. We ought to be joyful in all of this. We are blessed. Say that, say that with me. We are blessed, church. 1 John 3, 1 says, see what kind of love the Father has given. Look at it. Look at this great love he's given us. That love that says that we should be called the children of God. You should be called the children of God, and we are. We are the children of God. We have hope. We have peace. We have life. We have meaning. We have focus. We have everything we have hoped for because we have found it in Christ. Church, we are blessed. What a blessing. What a blessing. We are blessed. This is a gift that God has given to us. And we see that. It's going to manifest itself in a few different reasons. You know, we have the ability to hope and have joy in this world. The people outside the church do not have that. If you don't know Christ, you don't know that there's an eternal purpose to things that are going on here. You can hope for the best. You can try to keep a good, positive attitude. I've met some very, very positive thinkers, but they don't know Christ. So they're not hoping in the right things. We ought to take joy from the fact that, that since we can't control things, but that he can, we can rest. We should stop running around trying to freak out and try to handle everything and just rest in God. If you're called to go and do something, of course, go and do it. Be faithful. But we can rest in God. And the Bible tells us, I think it's Psalm 46, 1, cease striving and know that I am God. Cease striving. Another version of that says, be still. Know that I am God. How can you be still? How can you cease striving? By knowing, resting in the truth, believing that God is God, that he's got things well under control, and we as the believer have that hope, we have that peace. This is a gift that he has given us. This is a gift that for as long as we live here on earth, we can rest in his plan, we can rest in his purpose, we can rest in his provision. There is nothing that we do futilely in this life provided we are focused on the eternal things of God and that's what we're seeking. We don't need to deal with all those stressors anymore. He has freed us from those burdens. We take joy in the life and the work that he has provided because he has provided it. He says the best thing to do is to just live your daily life and all the other associated elements. You know what he says in here? Uh, you should eat and drink and enjoy life. When, when you see that phrase appear in the Bible, it's usually just talking about just the day-to-day -day life. When Jesus was uh, saying, uh, giving the reference to how Jonah uh, or Noah, when he was going to go into the ark, he says in that day, in Noah's day, people were eating and drinking. They were marrying, being given in marriage. And he means eating and drinking. They were just living life. They were focusing on anything else. We can focus on the right things and just eat and drink. We can live our lives while focused on the eternal things. 
your day-to-day life ought to be walking through that. We can take pleasure in our work. We don't need to focus on the negatives. We don't need to say, oh, I've got to get up early. I've got to travel so far. I've got to go do this. Praise God that we have work. Praise God that he has provided for us. Through our eternal focus on Jesus, we can walk through the day whistling without having to fake it. Church, you know, I know there's a lot of you right now walking through a lot of different struggles. So if you're not feeling that, I'm tracking with you. I've been there. But the fact that he says we should rejoice, the fact that he says we should hope, says one, that it's something we're able to do. God doesn't call us to things we cannot do. But it's something we ought to walk in. Something we ought to rest in. So can I encourage you, church, maybe this is the point you would take today. Don't ignore everything else, but hey, realize that you, if he said to have hope, if he had said to have joy, there's joy to be had. Let's find it. Don't look for it outside anywhere else. Look for it in him because that's where it's at. Maybe that's why right now. Maybe that's why you don't have the joys. Maybe you're not walking with him right now. Maybe you need to come back. Maybe you need to say, I need to do more than just a quiet time. I need to do more than just read the verse of the day and then go about my day. I need to take God's word and I need to sit and I need to marinate in it. I need to meditate on it. I need to remember the promises of God and how good he is to me. Amen? God is good. God is good, church. Through an eternal focus on Jesus, we can find joy in the things of life. And I wrote down uh, just a few examples here of things I've seen in my life that maybe would would help you with that too. You know, uh, complaining about dirty dishes. Every, every day, I, I do the dishes after, after dinner and I put those things together. I gotta rinse them off and throw them in the dishwasher and I, I, I dislike it. But I tell you what, that's one of the ones that's convicted me lately to say, praise God for those dirty dishes because one, it means I have food in my belly. Usually it means I've got a, prepare, a place to prepare it. Thank God that I had dishes to eat off of. You, know, I'm, you can be tired after working, but praise God you've been provided for. You know, yard work around the house means by God's grace, you've got a yard and you've got a house. It might be a hassle to pull weeds and to rake those leaves, but praise God we've got it, amen? Praise God we have a home for that. You know, screaming kids, that means often frustration, noise, and messes, but it also means some of the sweetest moments I have ever experienced in my life. Some of the deepest, truest, purest moments of love and joy I've ever felt is when, you know, your kid tells you for the first time, Dad, I love you. Or comes and just gives you a hug out of nowhere. Who brings you that macaroni necklace that looks like it was just thrown together with a bunch of glue and dog food, but it came from the heart of someone who loves you like crazy. That's a blessing. The kids make noise, they make messes, but what a blessing they are. Dealing with upset customers in your business is an opportunity to show grace and to bless people who right now we're going to walk out of that interaction with you more furious than ever, but you could bring hope to them. You could bring peace to them by telling them Christ lives and he loves and he cares and he saves. And I'm not hopeless today because of him. There are countless examples of this. The way we do this Practically, you know, especially when we don't feel like it, is by keeping that focus that God is eternal, that he is sovereign over all things. This may mean, you know, we make changes with how we live our lives, how we spend our time, how, uh, what we're doing. You know, this, this might even be a challenge to you today to, to say, I don't, I don't feel like that, Carl. I don't have that right focus. Then at, let's ask some questions. What are you reading right now? Are you reading the Bible or are you reading Sports Illustrated? Are you reading Maxim? Are you reading uh, Mad Magazine? Are you looking at things on the internet you shouldn't be looking at instead of a daily devotional? Are you spending more time uh, angry at your boss as opposed to finding something else? What are you focusing on? What are you reading? What are you filling your mind with? Church, there's, there's, there's a line of thinking out in the world who don't know Christ. We're always talking about positive thinking and negative thinking. Those are the things that are going to determine your future. That is not the end all, but there is certainly an element of truth to that. When we are focused on the eternal things of Christ, we are able to have that hope and that peace. When we focus on the minuscule, futile, worthless things of life as our source of contentment, it's no surprise that they do not content us. Doesn't that make sense? I'm not talking about positive and negative thinking. I'm talking about positive and right, focused thinking. Remembering that God has things well under control because when we're focused on God's and the eternal things and the impact of that kingdom, not the things of the world, We find the excitement, we find the joy, we find the peace, we find the hope, everything we've been looking for, other places. We don't have to look anymore because we found it in Christ. God's gift to man in all these times that change, all these seasons, all these impacts, all these events, we're able to take joy in those. And no one else besides God's people can do that. That is a gift to you, church. That is something that is unique to the people of God to find peace. There are people out there, again, that will walk, they'll, they'll put off an aura of peace. And you know, they may be walking all right, but I promise you, 
There's something in there that would, because God's put eternity in their heart, they're missing it. If you don't have Christ, you're missing the whole thing. Everything else is worthless. Sure, you should do good things, but that's not the point of life. Standards of good and holy and what's right and wrong are, 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 have a bigger thing than just what we see in the world. There are bigger things going on behind the scenes here, and all of them are working towards God's glory. No one else has this. There's truth to this. We're reminded of that in Psalm 16. When we're focused on Christ, this goes the right way because in your presence, it says, there is fullness of joy. Where is the joy? Is it in that new car? If it was, I promise you, the scriptures would have said that. The scriptures would have said, hey, the, the, in, in the presence of the Lamborghini, in the watching of the movie, in the gaining of the new spouse, there is fullness of joy. But that's not what it says. With the Lord, that is where the fullness of joy is. You might find good, great joy in other places. I'm not saying you can't find joy. You will not find the truest, purest, most appropriate joy ever outside of Christ. These are facts, church. These are facts. These are facts that say the Lord is sovereign over all things. He is eternal. He's ordained all things as they should be in this time and for his purpose. But man is not that way, right? We, we know that God is eternal, but we are not. We know that God is perfect and that we are not. We know that we are limited in lifespan while God is eternal. We are limited in understanding. We are limited in power, but God is not. These things are, are facts. And verses 14 and 15 actually emphasize these points for us. It reminds us that God has set things exactly as they should be. They are perfect in every way. What it says, it says, God does everything and endures forever. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be taken from it. What does that mean? It means that everything is perfect. It means everything is as God has set it to be currently for his plan and for his purpose. There's nothing to add to it. There's nothing to take away. There's nothing to amend. No, you don't have a better idea, a better time frame, a better activity, or a better outcome of it than he does. He has a clear purpose for all of this. Of course, as we noted earlier, there are things in this that absolutely impact you and bless you. There are certainly things that work towards the plan of God that go around like that. But ultimately, all these things work for his glory. He has made these things as they are so that people will fear him, it says. Spoiler alert, that's the point of the whole book. The point of this whole book here. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says this. this is, he's wrapping up the book. That they we're not there yet, but he's, he, this is how he, he ends the book. He says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Period. What's the deal? What's the deal? What's he wants to hear? Here's the deal. Fear God. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. What's your job? Fear God. Keep his commandments. Fear, revere, love, honor, bless, be obedient to the name of Christ. Be faithful to him. This is the whole duty of man. As we look at these truths, as we look at his power, as we look at our limitations, we find that the result in our hearts ought to be submission to him in every single way. Church, I, don't, I, I can't emphasize it enough that God does not care so much about your happiness as he does about your holiness. So many things I see out in the world presented by people uh, in the church and, out, and uh, those officially designated by a church doing something or just Christians, uh, they're trying to give happy devotional thoughts that are good in some element, but they always miss, so often I should say, not all the time, very often miss the point of trying to take a practical moment and say, here's how to feel better right now in the moment, as opposed to here's how to build a strong foundation for everything that comes in life. And that comes from holiness first. But church, can I tell you, holiness leads to happiness because holiness leads to contentment in Christ through obedience to him. The result from this ought to be total submission to him. We ought to worship him for his sovereignty, for his power, for his plan. We ought to praise God that we've been brought into his family and given a reason to live a purpose in life, a future and a hope. And one of the things I was reading through here, a, a commentary by a man named Reich, and he wrote this. He, he quoted Charles Bridge. Uh, he said, I have found more in Christ than I ever expected to want. I have found more in Christ than I even knew I wanted. What a thought. What a truth. There is more to Christ than I ever thought that I wanted. Verse 15 assures us there's no changing what he's done. There's no thwarting the plans of God. There's no changing what he's done. He's done before. He's going to do it again. There's nothing new in the world. We talked about that a few weeks ago. 
Things will continue as they have because God has set them that way. They will go as they should into the future because God has set it that way. This is no mere mention of this, church. This is an emphatic point. It's one more evidence for us to trust in the sovereignty, the plan, and the power of God. If we're doing nothing else today, church, we ought to rest in the sovereign plan and power of God. But I do have a couple action steps for you here because these are, these are truths that we absolutely ought to believe and know and walk in. But again, we don't feel it sometimes. We are highly emotional beings. We ought not let those emotions get the best of us at the expense of the facts. But sometimes we don't feel it. So here's some practical tips on how we can try to lean into that, how we can walk through it a little better. I'm going to give you a couple applications for how to, to walk in this, how to fully embrace that and to rest in the sovereignty of God and to see how he's working in these things here. Uh, there are certainly, there's going to be more applications than this. These are just three that we've got here. The first one, though, is to let go. Let go of yourself and live for God. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This life that I live in the body now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The call to die to self is at the absolute top of the list of all these things here. It's at the forefront, looking at Christ and his kingdom instead of ourselves and our daily struggles. Church, I am as guilty as anyone of still trying to go my own way sometimes. By God's grace, he works with me. He convicts me of sin. He, he challenges me in how I should grow and how I should step forward. But I still, at times, I'm emotional. This, this past week, I tell you what, I've, I've, I've cried. I've been angry. I've been frustrated It's a hard time to walk through some of the things we go through, but the times, church, of greatest growth and closeness with God have come when I've died to myself. When I've said, Lord, I don't get this. I don't feel right about this. I don't feel this in the moment, how it's supposed to feel. I'm, I'm hurt. I'm broken. I'm sad. But when I die to that and say, Lord, I look to you, Lord, you can make it beautiful, that's where that peace, that contentment that comes from, that's where the greatest growth comes from. That's where the intimacy with God comes from. Let go. Church, I don't know what you're hanging on. Die to yourself. If you're not a Christian, die to yourself. Live for Christ. Come into his family. Come and be saved. But if you are a Christian, continually, daily die to yourself. He says daily take up your cross. Die to self that we might live in him. Let go of yourself. Live for God. Second thing, lean in. I mean, dig in, get lean in, discover the joy of serving God. Instead of resisting these trials and these troubles of life, may we embrace them with an internal viewpoint on it of saying, this is going to honor God. It's going to grow me. It might hurt like crazy, but what a great thing it's going to be. You know, Paul told us in Romans that the, the, the sufferings we face in this world, we shouldn't even bring them up because they are so minuscule and pointless compared to how great the glory of God is and what we have looking forward to, or to look forward to in heaven. This bit of heaven, we're not going to remember the struggles we went through here. We're going to be in heaven focusing on Christ, glorifying Christ, rejoicing in that, never even counting these things that we went through. We will remember what he went through to purchase us. Lean in to that, discover that. You know, that might be texting, taking the next step in, in serving God. Lean into it. Maybe it's, it's trusting him more. Maybe it's joining a small group. Maybe it's inviting someone to join you for church. Maybe it's you saying, all right, this piece of scripture, I believe it, but it's really hard for me to walk in and to rest in and to follow. Follow it. Lean into it. You know, the more when, when things come our way, uh, you know, if a ball flies by, you get out of the way. If, if you're standing on the side of a road and a car comes by too close, you get out of the way. We want to dodge trouble. Stop dodging trouble. I'm not saying go looking for it, but I'm saying in the moment, you can lean into that. You can say, God, I don't know what's coming through here, but I trust that you're working in it. Lean into that. Rest in it. We can find joy in serving God because... We are living as he would have us live. As we, as we serve him, we walk with him in that. You know, we're reminded of what I said a moment ago. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. We are often the closest to God when we are walking through the toughest of times. And in his presence, there's fullness of joy. So let go of yourself, die to yourself, lean and discover the joy of serving God, and then lead out. Be an example of joyful living. I don't mean fake till you make it, but to say, hey, there's a reason to smile. There's a reason to still share hope with others, even when you're hurting. Let go, uh, lean in, and then lead out. Be an example here. It's hard to do it. I know it. I know it's hard to do it sometimes. Remember these truths that are unchanging, irrevocable. 
God is with us. God has saved us. Jesus promised that when we went out to, to do work in his kingdom, that he would be with us even to the end of the age. He'd be with us the entire time. Shine your light out there. This is part of what we need to be diligent in churches. Even when we don't feel like it, we are still faithful. Matthew 5.16 tells us we ought to let our light shine before others so that they may see our good works and glorify God in heaven. We don't show our good works to brag on ourselves. We do good works so we can say, look what God is doing. I went out today and I wanted to help this person so I share the love of Christ in a practical way. Maybe it's helping someone change a tire. Maybe it's babysitting a kid. Maybe it's running an errand for someone. Maybe it's going grocery shopping. Maybe it's bringing food or or, uh, yard work. There's a lot of different things that we can do out there. We would ought to do those things so that God would get the glory. We ought to say, listen, I'm doing this to show the love of Christ in a practical way. We at Anchor West, when we go out and we, we do certain ministries, if we give someone a gift, we always say we're doing this to show the love of Christ in a practical way. We don't want to just say Jesus loves you. That's truth. That's absolutely true. But we don't want to just rest on that. We want to show that to them. We let our lights shine to bless the people, to honor and glorify God. May they give God glory as we do that. So church, share the hope that you have. If you're not in the mood, don't fake it. Say, hey, I'm struggling right now, but this is the hope I have. This is why I know that tomorrow's going to be better. The hope we have in this. When you're not in the mood, remember the truths that we've looked at today. Share the hope that you have in Christ. The hope that we have, church, hinges on Christ not our own ideas. We look at the world and and chasing those pursuits and we say, man, that's futility. And Solomon has echoed that for us. But when we focus on the eternal things, man, we can can lean in, we can let go, we can can lead out, we we can grow, we can take joy. We ought to take joy. Church, that's the command today. You know, I don't want to push this too far into it, but if this is a command that the Lord has given us and we disobey it, is that not sin? I don't want to say that you're sinning if you're not being joyful. Don't misunderstand. But church, I'm saying the charge is for the believer to walk in joy because of what God has done, because of how he's done it, and because of who he is. He is sovereign. He does whatever he pleases, and he pleases. It pleased him to bring you into his family. It pleased him to crush his son that we might be li- that we might live forever, that we might repent of our sin. If you've never done that before, hey, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today, don't, don't sit here and think, oh, Carl, that's, that's good for the Christian. I want to go to heaven, but I don't want this God stuff. You, you can't say those kind of things. You've got to talk for real. You've got to say, listen, God is holy and I'm not. That's the deal. That's the gospel. God is holy, I'm not. And he sent his son to come and die in my place to save me. And so that if I would believe in him, that his sacrifice of living a perfect life, dying a death on a cross, being raised again, and that that would satisfy the wrath of God, if I believe those things, repent of my sins, and then follow him, and I'm filled with his Holy Spirit through his work, that's when we're saved. That's the stuff that matters. That's where true hope can come in because you know, if you're not walking with Christ, if you don't know Christ, if you're not saved, none of these things are for you yet. But for those who are God's people, we have the promise of peace. We have the promise of hope. We have the promise of purpose. We have the promise that no matter what comes our way, he makes everything beautiful, appropriate in his time. I don't know about you, church. I feel privileged to be a part of that, that my life is able to bring glory to God. And I hope we'll walk in that. I hope you'll walk in that truth today. I hope that you will take these things and say, I I can see bad, I can see good. The Lord is good. The Lord is sovereign. The Lord is faithful. So there is nothing better for me to do. There's nothing better for you to do today, church, than to live life, your daily life, with joy. Take the enjoyment that is there to be had. May you have more joy as you remember the promises of God. As you walk out of this message today, may you be blessed by the truths that are in it. Not because I brought them not because I'm an orator of the word or the best speaker. Walk in them because of the truth that is in there that says that God loved you, that he gave his life for you, that you have eternal hope, security, and peace, and that we can take joy in this life. We don't understand all the things that are going on. We don't understand God's plan, but we know God and he knows us. Church, please, today, walk in that. If you are discouraged, if you need help, if you need prayer, hey, don't, don't walk away from that. Tell us in the comments here on the page. Share with us how we can pray for you. If it's a little too private, send it to us in a message. Send it to Anchor Church West, North, South, wherever you're at. Send it to your campus. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Church, there's hope to be had. Let's walk in those things. Let's rejoice in those things. Let's do that together as the family of God working together. Amen? Let's commit these things to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're grateful today for the truths of your word that remind us that you are the sovereign king, that you are a great king, and you have things well under control. Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit 
to anoint us, to enable us as your people to, to walk in these truths, to rest in them, that even when we are walking through hard times and we can't see the light where we can't see what's going on and we are confused about things, Father, may we rest in your promises. May we be faithful to the command to rejoice in it. May we be excited about the fact, Lord, that you said there's nothing better for us to do that the best thing to do in that moment, in this time, in this life we have, is to do good, to honor you, to faithfully follow your commands, and to be joyful as we do it. Lord, may all these things work towards your great glory as you have set them to do. May we die to ourselves all the more, Jesus, and proclaim you all the more, because you are a great and a wonderful Savior. We bless your name and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us with this church. You know, we've got some time of worship coming up here. So as we walk in this time, would you let's 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 we keep our Bibles open. We want to have God's word there, but let's prepare ourselves to kind of transition from this. Uh, if you've read through the Old Testament before, you know that when Moses brought the law, uh, brought down the commandments, he told the people what God thought. They said, We're gonna do that, and then they worship the Lord. So today we've looked at his word. We've seen some great truths, we've seen some great promises. May that be the motivation in us to sing these praises along with me. You know, if you're not a great singer, if you're alone, sing anyways. Let's bother your neighbors. Sing through the walls. Let's sing along with this song. If you're not a great singer with that and you're still intimidated because you're around other people, meditate on these words. Let's let these words sink into our hearts. May we offer them up as praise to the one who bought us and the one who's so very worthy. Let's worship together. How deep your Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss the Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory Paid my ransom. 